So let me actually start by thanking Martin for hosting me this week in Zurich. We're going to spend the next 60 minutes or so on a deep reflection on the current state of the industry and by extension its future and your future. I see quite a few familiar faces in the crowd from previous uh, seminars I did here. For those who don't know who I am, I'm the principal of iDesign, a company I founded 20 years ago for the sole purpose of doing nothing but software design. And when we say software design, we mean both system design and project design. I am actually in town now for my project design masterclass, and I was here a year ago for my system design, the architect's masterclass. Over the years, I've helped hundreds of companies all over the globe use these ideas and techniques, and I've launched the careers of thousands of architects. Before I designed in the late 90s, I was the chief software architect of a Fortune 100 company in Silicon Valley, and I managed the architecture department. Before that, I was the vision architect, before that I was a project architect, before that I was just an architect. I'm at the beginning of my fourth decade in design. I published eight books so far. The latest one is Writing Software. Note the spelling, the homophonic. It's about fixing the industry. And tonight's session is mostly in the book. The last part of the session is not in you, but by the time I get it, you realize why it's not in the book. I published more than 100 magazine articles and system wide papers on my ideas and techniques in software development and design. I never worked for Microsoft, but I was privileged to be part of the design effort of some of the key products of Microsoft, like C Sharp, later on WCF. Microsoft recognized me as a software legend due to the impact I've had on the industry over the years. If you need to contact me, it's iDesign.net. Okay, so let's start. It's not going very well, is it? Software development, by and large, sucks. There's a huge gap between how you thought it's going to look like and what it actually looks like. Everywhere you look, it's broken. And, and what's acute about the way software is broken, it's actually multidimensional. Every aspect of software development is broken. Cost. Nobody has any idea how much anything costs. If you ask developers how much it costs to do something, they'll say, well, we have to build it to answer that question. How much will it cost to do this feature? Nobody knows. If you're going to be off by a factor of 10 or 100, nobody knows. Schedule means nothing for software developers. For most developers, deadlines are these useless things wishing by as you're doing your work. The deadline looks like this. You're in your office, doing your work, a deadline wishes by. You keep you doing your work. Nobody cares. How can you run a business when time and money do not matter? How? You couldn't operate a hot dog stand if time and money doesn't matter. You understand? And yet the entire industry tries to pretend that time and money does not matter. Requirements. Developers often solve their own problems. And everybody takes it for granted, they're going to give you the wrong requirements. We're going to talk about requirements. Why is that? Why the perpetual breakdown in communication here? And then you have the audacity of blaming the customer. You say, you bid customer, you gave me the wrong requirements. Really? Who's in the software development business? You or the customer? So how could it possibly be the customer's fault? Then we have quality. Software is bugs. Everybody takes for granted software is bugs. If I were to tell you that every project I was ever involved in, I shipped on schedule, on budget, with zero defects, which part of this sentence aggravates you more? <laughs> this, <laughs> what? You would say it's impossible. Now, I completely agree that the crooked way you're doing it, it's impossible. That's not a surprise. I just never did it the way you're doing it. <coughs> then there's staffing. Even if somebody figured out how to do something right, that somebody is gone, the knowledge is gone forever. Oh, don't you touch that, don't go there. Nobody ever dares go there. 
excuse me. Can I get a cup of water? And I'm not saying it's completely broken, I'm saying hardly anyone is doing it right. Every once in a while you find somebody who knows how to do it, but it's certainly not repeatable. It's not a repeatable engineering effort. In engineering, everybody knows how to do something. Nobody expects bridges to collapse. Not these bridges, no bridges. And no houses should collapse, and no airplane fall from the sky. The essence of engineering is good repeatability. That's not software. It's called software engineering, it's nothing but. Now this is not new. It's been around for a long time. And software architects were the great hope of the previous two decades. Somewhere around the late 90s, the term the architect has emerged to kind of capture these aspects of making it maintainable and reusable and secure. And 20 years later, let's acknowledge the reality. These people are nothing but quacks. Shaman. Alchemists. How do I know that? I look at the results. The result is no better. Now they pretend to know better, but they don't produce anything better. They're just alchemists. If I ask the average architect, how do you make it maintainable? They don't know. And why do you claim to be an architect? Here's a painting called The Alchemist. Now this is actually a 19th century painting by uh, but it's done in the style of the old Dutch masters. And when uh, uh, Richner did this painting, he literally made a mockery of an alchemist. Look at the solemn look. Look at the gown and the cape. Look at the fine instrument of measurement here. Look at the noxious vapors coming out of it. That's your average architect. All rituals. No essence. But now when the CTO, the CEO hears architect, you know what they hear? They hear quack. That's what they hear. He's saying, oh, this is so much better than this. We don't use the sand. Uh, no, 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 we have uh, 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 REST API, Python, and Lambda expressions. Of course, you're actually doing this. This is a modern software architect. Got some lightning going on, got some fancy lights. Let's toss it into AWS and look at the metrics. What? It's still alchemy. In what way is that actually any better? Then there's Agile. Agile is nothing but a sick joke. Most projects are slow, expensive, and rife with defects. You know what? If you say slow and expensive, I imagine an elephant. If you say agile, I imagine a bunny. A bunny is agile. Zing, zing, zing. Elephant, slow and expensive. Nobody looks at the elephant and say, that elephant, so agile. <laughs> but if your project is slow and expensive and its life is different, you call that agile? Is this a joke? Something else is going on. By now the rot runs so deep, Agile perform a mental trick on people. Agile lets practitioners skirt the issue of not knowing how to design system and projects. You see, it's one thing if you call yourself an architect or software engineer. I never understand the fact that we have all these people, so-called software engineers, with a business card called software engineer, that resent any attempt of doing design. I mean, to me, the word engineer and the word design are synonymous. But we have the best methodology, let's not pretend that it's okay if, if you don't do design. It's okay. And that makes them feel so good about themselves. Thank you. That makes them feel so good about themselves because if you think about it, if it's part of your job to do design, be it software design, project design, and you don't know how to do it, or you fail to do it every time, then you should feel bad about it. But the blessed methodology lets them pretend it's okay. It's okay, actually. Look, if you're a 10th century doctor and you're supposed to kill patients, but every time you touch a patient, you kill the patient, you should feel pretty bad about it. In fact, by now, the mental contortion is such, it lets them pretend it would be bad if they were even to try and do design. Oh, let's big up fun design, blah, 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 blah. Excuse me? By now, people have spent sometimes a decade or two in the software industry 
without seeing software done right even once. Now think about it. It's one thing if you don't know how to do it, and that's shame on you. But this guy over there is doing it. So you know what? Obviously it's possible. They've never seen anybody else doing it. So by now all they can conclude is that it cannot be done. Now that's actually a logical fallacy. That's confusing absence of evidence with evidence of absence. The fact that you've never seen that right doesn't mean it can't be done, it just means you don't know how to do it. It's true with quality, it's true with everything. But you've convinced yourself it's impossible. That's how bad things are now. I'm not going to pretend to you that I have a silver bullet. When the interest in the industry that spent decades digging a deep hole, you're not going to solve it in one evening. Here is another painting for you. This one is by Boigel and it's called The Alchemist. Now this is your typical software shop. They're doing a sprint right now. <laughs> Here is the Scrum Master. Here are the desperate developers. Here's the alchemist banging on some pots and pans. Look at the debris on the floor. And you know, outside it's sunny and people are happy, but inside it's chaos. It's debris. It's despair. And this is supposed to be the smartest guy in town. It's the alchemist. Borgel knew 500 years ago this is total BS, okay? What's the way out? If we have a multi-dimensional crisis, we cannot solve it by solving just one aspect. We're going to have to fix all the aspects. So we have this combination of system design, and project design, and process design, and tools design, and even career design. In addition, we do not have all the pieces yet to solve it all. I will point tonight at the direction we need to take as an industry to solve it. That direction is going to have profound implication on the industry and your livelihood. So let's start. I'm going to start with a very conventional description of how software development should have looked like. Okay? You should produce some kind of a design document around your system. You should design not just the second parameter for the fourth method, but things like the project overview. What are we here for? Are we here because it's cool? Or because it adds value to a customer? And what is that value? What's the operational concept? We're coming over here from this queue, we're going to the cloud, we're going this, we do that. Now, what's our assumption? We never do this, we always do that. The interfaces, the services, the parameters, sample code, all of that. Without this, nobody could ever maintain, extend, or use your code. At which point, why would you do design? Design doesn't help you with the feature, it helps you with being maintainable, extensible, reusable, secure. Design attributes. And you don't have some kind of a linked HTML document and so on. Let's talk about requirements. It may come to you as a complete shock to learn you're doing it wrong. Most people capture requirements in a functional way. What does it mean? If I have a requirement spec, of course, most people don't even bother to have a requirement spec, but if I have a requirement spec, it would read 1 by 2 plus 3, system should do A. 4 plus 5 plus 6, system should do B. These are functional requirements. And that's really, really bad. Why? Because functional requirements are always open for interpretation. The customer wanted this, you delivered that. Almost the same. There's this, there's that, and there's, it's almost the same. As a result, it's a really bad idea to talk about the required functionality. It's much better to talk about the required behavior. Best way of capturing required behavior is in form of a use case. Use case is a form of a story. For example, compare the following requirement. 1.2.3, system should open a file. You're saying, what's wrong with this? I've seen it a million times before. Yes, I know. Here's the same requirement as a use case, as a required behavior. The system would present the user with a standard Windows open file dialog or a custom application file dialog. The filter and dialog would be star.log. The system would only allow the user to navigate to a portion of the drive where they have NTFS permission to go to. The system would maintain a write exclusive read non-exclusive lock on the file. The system would log the name of the file the user selected. 
If within three hours the user hasn't released the file, the system would abandon the file, release the logs, log it, and, 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 and. As developers, which one you would like to receive? System should open the file or the use case. We know. You have to understand that the permanent miscommunication between customers and developers is always going to be there. Why? Because we have misinterpretation of reality. If you give them use cases, you much narrow the gap here. It's a lot harder to misinterpret the use case. Note I didn't say user story, I said the use case. In almost all systems today, what the user sees is the tip of the iceberg. The bulk of the system below the waterline. For example, Google. Are you telling me Google is just fill up text box and hit search? That's Google? Text box? Search? What percentage of Google is below the waterline? How many nines? <laughs> okay, of course. That's an extreme example, but almost every business application, that's what we have today. Okay? Now, the best way of capturing use cases is graphically. You could actually write it down in words. The problem is nobody ever reads anything. And the reason nobody reads anything is because reading is artificial to the human brain. As a species, we've been doing reading for less than 5,000 years. It's not enough evolution to catch up. If you look at brain scan of people reading, you see neurons flashing in the digestive center, the language center, the cognitive center, the language, the, as the brain is trying to figure out what's going on. On the other hand, half your brain, from here to here, half your brain, is a giant video processing card. So image processing we do in hardware, reading we do in software. So it's very slow, very expensive, and the brain doesn't like to do it at all. Which is why nobody reads anything. They will watch a movie, but I'm not going to read a book. Why? Right? Because reading is hard. So if you want to capture it graphically, you should use activity diagrams. Now, activity diagrams are very different from flowcharts. Never use a flowchart to capture required behavior. What do most people use? They use flowcharts. Why shouldn't you use flowcharts? Flowcharts have no notion of time. How do you show in a flowchart blocking, waiting for something to happen? How do you show concurrent execution? How do you show a sync and execution over here? You don't. It turns out time is absolutely paramount in required behavior. But the graphical notation of flowchart does not capture it. Activity diagrams have a notion of time. You don't have to know anything about the notation to see that this call chain stops over here, then these events happen, then these three things happen in parallel. Or they could at least happen concurrently. And so you want to do it graphically. Now, a decent system could have 100 use cases, 200, 300. Does it mean you should have 300 diagrams? In theory, yes. In practice, nobody has the time to draw 300 diagrams. Some use cases are simple enough, you can do it in text. My rule of thumb is the nested if. Whenever the use case contains a nested if, you must do it graphically. Why? Because no human can read and parse a sentence with a nested if. It reads like this. It's this reason it, but if this happened, and if this happened, boop, you just lost the reader completely. Nobody can pass that sentence. In fact, if you watch people passing such sentences, they take a piece of paper and pen, and they start doodling on the side, trying to visualize what you're calling for. And the moment they try and visualize, they're interpreting. And the whole point here is to avoid the interpretation, or Murphy says, the misinterpretation. What does Murphy say, the miss or will interpret? Which one is it going to be? We know we're going to misinterpret. Now, in an activity diagram, you could have 17 nested ifs. It's all so what? In a diagram, 17 nested ifs is nothing. In a text, good luck with that. You lost the reader after the second. Separate from that is the act of design validation. How do I know this is any good? So miraculously, the alchemist, or sorry, the architect, decompose the system into a set of building blocks. Architecture is always an act of decomposition. You take a big nebulous idea and you break it down into smaller building blocks. You can call them components, modules, classes, services, it doesn't matter. These are elements of decomposition. Now, who says that decomposition is any good? 
there's an act of design validation. Imagine that you can create some kind of a sequence, some kind of an interaction between your components for each use case. You can even capture it formally in some kind of uh, sequence diagram. If you can generate a diagram like this for every use case, you have a valid design. I didn't say it's a great design, I said it's a valid design. Everything the use case has called for, I have a combination of my components that satisfy them. That means you have a valid design. The overall flow of information to the project looks like this. Every software project has two aspects to it. It's got a business domain, it's got a software domain. In the business domain, things start with some kind of marketing requirements. These marketing requirements tend to be the things that the customer talks to the marketing person, the product manager. Typically, you cannot work against these for two reasons. First of all, they are highly, highly functional. These are the open file, 1.2.3, do A, and so on. In addition, there has to be an act of derived requirements. Why? Suppose a customer asks for the moon. Are you going to give the moon? Yeah, 1.2.3, give me the moon. Are you going to give the moon? And the answer is no. But if the customer would go for Swiss cheese, he would say Swiss cheese. If indeed the customer will go with the Swiss cheese, which remains to be seen. So there's always an act of derived requirements. Now, in addition, there are going to be certain things in your system that no customer ever asked for. That's how you innovate. Henry Ford said that if he listened to his customer, all they would want is a faster horse. Let me assert something here. No customer has ever, ever said to Apple, give me the iTunes and the Apple Store and the iPhone. Not even once, okay? If you listen to your customers, you're not going to get very far. So, there are things here which are not here, things here which are not here. How about sometimes you do something in your project that no customer asks for, but it helps you with another project? Could be. All the time. So, there are things here which are not here, things here which are not here, but by and large, the Venn diagram is a lot of overlap. Now, this is still highly functional, I cannot work with it. So, there's also an act of converting it into use cases. All about this part of the business domain of the system. On the software part, we have two subdomains. We have a static aspect and a dynamic aspect. A classic static aspect is the architecture. I've got layers, inside layers I have components and so on. Your SDD, your software design document, is also fairly static. It's just text. But you can say things like the second parameter for the forced method is an integer and the allowed value and so and so and the pre and post condition for the assignment and this and that. That's a good SDD. The dynamic aspect is the interaction diagram. Interaction diagram simply shows how some interaction between these components satisfy a particular use case. What is code? Done this way, coding is the act of marrying the interaction diagram to the STD. Coding is very simple. Look, give me this using this. You got that? That's it. That's what coding is. Now, this is the finished product. It never actually starts this way. Why? Because all design is always iterative. At the beginning of the project, you don't have all the requirements. You certainly don't have the right architecture. What you have is notions. You have some notion of requirements, some notion of what the architecture could look like. Some notion. It's a notion. And you start fiddling with it. You say, look, uh, could I put the components I have to do this use case? No, it doesn't work. But, but you know what? If I take this one and split it in two, then I could have it. Oh, oh, that, that makes sense. I need two of them. Or maybe find out that you never use that component over there. You throw it away. So it's very easy to see that the requirements affects the architecture. What is less obvious is that the architecture affects the requirement as well. For example, what if you can put together your components and you satisfy a particular use case, and then there's a completely different use case that results in exactly the same interaction? What you have here is a duplicate requirement. Very common. Marketing talks to a customer. They use their vernacular, their jargon to describe something. It appears in a document. They talk to another customer, actually describing the same thing, but totally different, ends up also as a requirement. When you try and do the architecture, it's the same behavior. You can go back to marketing and say, look, you gave me one per two points late, 
and you gave me four and five and six, and it's, it's actually the same. Which one do you want me to keep? And then we'll say, well, I never thought about it this way. And you say, okay, that's fine, it's admirable. Which one do you want me to keep? And they say, uh, one point, two point three. You just eliminated the requirement. Sometimes you have two requirements, one point, two point three, which you can absolutely come up with an interaction diagram for, but then you cannot do four and five point six. Now you could do four point five point six, then you couldn't do one point two point three. What we have here is mutually exclusive requirements. A customer wants A, the other one wants B. One wants it black, the other wants it white. Now what? They can't both be right. And what if you have uh, 10 customers? Nine want to do A and the 10th wants to do a B. What are you going to do? And suppose they're truly mutually exclusive. Well, you go back to this guy and you say, look, you gave me this mutually exclusive. I can do A and I can do B, but I can't do both. And if they're any good, they will tell you, please let me get back to you on that one. And the reason is, how the business resolve it is something to be determined. What if A pays the bills today, but B is the future of the business? Could be. What if the way out is to pay the B customer to do an A and then you might everybody to B? I don't know how you resolve it. I know that how you resolve it is in the business domain, it's not in the software domain. Sometimes you can put your components together in a way that cannot be attributed to any requirement. You go back to marketing and say, look, we can also do this. Are you interested? And then we say, well, of course we're interested. Customers were already mentioned. I never thought it's possible. But yes, of course. You just made up new requirements. So the requirements affects the architecture. Architecture affects the requirement. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Eventually, the dust settles, and this is what it looks like. Okay? Now, unfortunately, most of you spend the last three minutes writing me off in your head. And what you all said to yourself something like this. This, beautiful. This is motherhood and apple pies. This is just amazing. This is so clean, so elegant. I love to do it. Nobody here says, oh, yuck. No, no, take it away. You all like it. At the same time, You've all compiled a list of reasons why you cannot do it. Every single one of you already explained to yourself why you can't do it. In your particular case, everybody else, of course, can do it. In your case, you can't do it. And you've already made some excuses in your head. And if I were to abstract away all of your excuses, we will end up with what I call the curse. With a capital C, the curse. And the curse is like a dark cloud above you. Everybody else has a sunny sky, above you thunderstorms all day long. Everywhere you go, there's a thunderstorm cloud with hail and lightning. And the curse sounds like this. You say, look, of course I'd like to do it. Who would want to do this? This is so structured, so elegant, except they keep changing this. And in fact, the, the time it takes them to change this is so much less than the time it takes me to do this that I can't actually do it. I mean, it's a nice idea, I have to admit, but no, no, not in my world. And I say, really? First of all, you think it's just you? Just in your case, just in your business, not in your division, just with your customer that keep changing the requirements? This is what requirements do. They change. And that is not a curse. That is a fantastic and wonderful thing. Why? Because if requirements were static, none of us would have a job. You and me are in this room right now because requirements change. Because if requirements wouldn't change, somebody somehow, somewhere would write the software once and they wouldn't need us. On the other hand, there's so few of us and so many of them. And the more requirements will change, the higher the demand for our services, the higher the compensation, the better the benefits. And would that be good or bad? Would that be good or bad? It would be fantastic. So, how could it be that something that is so fantastic, you call a curse? This is very human. Human beings always resent the hand that feeds them. The hand that feeds you is called change. And yet you bite it, you resent it, you fight it. 
Now, the reason you don't like change is the following. You say, look, I'd like to do something like this or whatever. But every time I design against the requirements, the requirements would change, I would have to change my design. And whenever I have to change the design, it is so painful, I hate it. And so, very quickly, you learn to resent changes. Why? Because you don't like pain. Nobody likes pain. Real people like pain. That's not you. You don't like pain. Right? And as a result, you call it a curse. So now something that is inherently fantastic. The one thing that pays the mortgage, sends the kids to school, gets the nice things in life, you hate. That's horrible. On the other hand, you say, well, you want me to like pain? So you actually have a conflict in your head, a dissonance. Because if you were to think about it, you recognize, of course I'm right, of course the quality change is good. On the other hand, you say it's bad. This, by the way, is the hallmark of insanity. When you have two conflicting concepts in your head, side by side. It's a form of insanity. And it never occurred to you to resolve the conflict. The solution is so simple, it has eluded and escaped all of you your entire career. Unless you spend a week with me before, you have never heard about this solution. I'm going to say the solution and your head is going to explode. Okay? The solution is, never, ever, 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 ever design against the requirements. That's it. That's the solution. Unless you like pain. If you like pain, keep doing it. That's just fine. You think, what? Uh, uh, uh. Look, a guy goes to the doctor and says, Doc, it hurts when I do this. What will the doctor say? Don't do that. Yes. So I have a very, very profound logic. I don't think pain is good. How about you stop inflicting pain on yourself? The pain you experience is self-inflicted. Was it part of the requirements? Did you have 7.8.9 and you're required to do it the worst possible way? Please maximize pain. Was it part of the requirements? Yes or no? Then you brought this pain on yourself. Any flaw in my logic so far? That's it. You're saying, uh, the problem you're struggling with it, even though it's evidently, it's self-evidently true, by the way, what I just said. I don't have to prove it to you. The reason you're struggling with it is because all you know how, what to do is to design against their clients. That's the problem. You've never seen anything else. Now, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, even if it's your toes. The only hammer you have, the only tool you have, is to design against the requirement. You've never seen anybody doing anything else. You have never done anything else. So you bang. Even if it's not a nail, you bang. Don't you understand that by designing against the requirement, you guaranteed the technical debt? You guaranteed the failure? Because the requirements changed. And with it, your design was out the window. And there's nothing more expensive and painful in software than change the design once you already wrote the code. Nothing. You have not just maximized, you not just inflicted pain, you have maximized your pain. You've done it the worst possible way. And then, of course, you glorify it. And you focus on the rituals. But tell me something, isn't plucking those user stories off the Kanban board and coding it the epitome of maximizing your coupling to the requirements? Isn't that the worst possible thing you can possibly do? And then you glorify it as the best practice. Look, for thousands of years, the cure was to put a leech on a patient. That was the best practice. For thousands of years, when the crop failed, 
People burn the witch. It can't hurt. That's basically the level of intellectual honesty you have. Because you should have seen it doesn't, it's not working for you. It has never worked for anybody else, by the way. But you just keep doing it. And you keep yearning for this mythical project where they will give you all the requirements. It's never going to change. You're going to get away with it. It's not going to happen. And it's a good thing it's not going to happen. You wouldn't have a job. Look at it from another perspective. Suppose on day one of the project, I give you a book with beautifully specced activity diagrams of every conceivable use case. And it's a big book. I have 100, 200, 300 use cases. It's all here in this book and it's never going to change. Here, I'm giving you the book. Code me this. Can you trust it, yes or no? No, because nobody in the history of the world has had enough time to build respect 300 use cases on day one of the project. You're not given good use cases on day one, ever. Why do you mean to transcribe it into things that you need to design and code? What's wrong with you? Tell me something. If I give you a book with 300 use cases, and suppose it's good, are you going to be surprised to learn that the real number is 330? You missed a few. Could be. Could be. Of course. And if I give you 300 use cases, are you going to be surprised to learn that the real number is 200? There's lots of duplicates. Could be. By the way, if you design against the requirements, you will do 50% more work. Good or bad? And if I give you a book with 300 use cases, and there's no duplicates, and you're not missing anything, could it be that in the future we are going to add other use cases? As of today, this is the set, but in the future we're going to add use cases. Could that be the case? And could it be that some of the use cases you're given today, you're going to have to remove, because by law you're not allowed to do this anymore. Could happen? And would that be a good or bad thing? Answer the question. <laughs> it would be a fantastic thing, because without it you wouldn't have a job. But not how hard it is for you to accept that it's actually a good thing, because you have used to accept it as a bad thing. Everything is upside down in your world. So if I give you a book of 300 use cases on day one of the project, which is why nobody's ever going to give you. You know what I actually just gave you? A steaming pile of manure. I gave you manure. Why do you treat it as gospel? Why? Okay. So let's start digging our way out of the hole you have created. If I give you a book with any use cases on day one of the project, can you trust it, yes or no? What did it just give you? Garbage. Garbage, thank you. That's really bad news. There's no denying it. It's bad news that you will never get the requirements right. However, there's a silver lining to this cloud. If I give you a book with certain use cases, are all of those use cases distinct and unique? Yes or no? No, of course not. Most of them are variation of other things. We have the happy case, the sad case, the incomplete case, the case we're just doing for that customer over there. Therefore, let's divide it into two types of use cases. Core use cases and fluff. Core use cases represents the essence of the business. This is what brings the customer to the door. Fluff is all the other things you have to do. Now, if I give you a book with certain use cases, how many core use cases do you actually have? I want you all to look at the application you're working on right now back in the office. And in your head, count how many true core use cases you actually have. And so, let's just try and give an order of magnitude here. Uh, just order of magnitude, no specific number. Is it more like 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000? Uh, pick one. Okay, I'm going to ask the question again. And this time I'm going to give you a hint. But every time I ask the question, the answer is buried in the way I ask the question. Okay, let's try it again. Let's agree on the order of magnitude of how many core use cases you have. Is it more like one, ten, a hundred thousand? Pick one. <laughs> one. Ten? Are you kidding me? Ten? 
all of you, go back in your office, in your mind, and start counting how many you have. Oh, we're doing this. We're doing this. Yeah. You didn't even get to five. You got two, you got three, maybe one. It's a ridiculously small number. Here's another proof. Suppose you're going to a marketing person and ask them, please write me a one-page brochure of the system. How many bullets are going to be on the brochure? How many bullets? What would happen to a marketing person that puts 10 bullets on the brochure? They look for another job at that point. There are going to be three bullets on the brochure. The top is going to be a picture of a happy customer, then three bullets, then a website. That's it. That's the brochure. If you put 10 bullets on it, you're going to lose your job in marketing. Okay? Go back to engineering, they will tell you. So we're talking a ridiculously small number. Now, in order of magnitude, when I'm saying one, it could be here, it could be three, it could be four. In our work at iDesign, I've lost count of how many systems we designed. It's in the many hundreds for sure. And by the way, I don't think anybody on planet Earth can make that statement. We have never seen more than six. Six was a system I've only seen once. It was a monster system with 40 services supporting the entire IT infrastructure of one of the largest companies on planet Earth, with offices in four continents and 120,000 users that chew on a system 24 by 7. It was a system of systems, really, and then you got six. More systems are not going to get six, and are not going to get four. Typically, we see one, two, three, four would be up to here. Five is exceptionally rare, I've only seen six once. That's kind of like the distribution. So it's a handful. Two, three, four would be up to here. Now, don't think for a second that anybody's going to give you the core use cases explicitly. Core use cases hardly ever appear in the requirement spec explicitly. This is not 1.2.3, this is a core use case. Core use cases are almost always the result of abstraction of other use cases. In addition, finding the use cases is always an iterative process. You could say to somebody that gives you the book we see on the use cases, or not that anybody ever does, but suppose, you say, okay, you give me 10 use cases, let me reject it like the steaming pile of manure that it really is. And now, suppose of this entire pile of things you gave me, I'm only doing one thing. Which one you want me to do? What do you mean just one? Come down, we're going to do more, we're going to do all of it and more. But suppose I were to do just one, which one is it? Uh, one for two points. That may or may not be a core use case. Now suppose I give you one more bullet, which one would it be? Uh, 4.5.6. At this point, they always give you a variation of the first. The first is such a core use case, they give you a variation. You say, no, no, don't waste a bullet on it. Pick something completely different. Uh, 7.8. By the time you're asking for the third, they start saying, well, I don't know, maybe adding, yeah, and yeah. Where are you going to get 6? Just not going to happen. It's a ridiculously small number. Now suppose they give you a book with 200 use cases and the real number is 300. They miss quite a few. Are they going to miss a core use case? No. The core use case is the essence. They're going to miss all the fluff. And the reason they're not going to miss a core use case is because the core use case relates directly to the essence of the business. And it turns out the essence of the business doesn't change. For example, the essence of the business of Federal Express is shipping packages. There is some probability that Federal Express is going to move into ballistic missile control. But how likely is it? And if it's likely, how soon it's going to happen? Probably after we're all dead. So it doesn't really matter. If you look at the application you're working on right now, go back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you will find it's the same application. Now, technology came and went, and cloud, and on-premise, all of that. The core use cases haven't changed. We take it from here, clack, clack, move it over there. That's it. That's what it's doing. So the core use case never changed. The fluff keeps changing all the time. Of course, customers, of course, points in time with the same customer, different security, like all of that, yes, yes, yes. But the core never changes. Why? Because the essence of the business doesn't change. We agree? Okay. So, 
Requirement is super important. I didn't say that I should take the requirement document, make a big ball of it, and toss it in the bin. Did I say you should analyze the requirements? No, I said you shouldn't design against the requirements. Analyze the requirements to discover the core use cases. And again, it's an iterative process and so on. Put it aside. Now, here's the mission in life of the architect. You need to discover and come up with a smaller set of building blocks that you can put together to satisfy each of the core use cases. Since all the other use cases are a variation of the core use cases, what they therefore represent is a different interaction between your building blocks, not a different decomposition thereof. So now when the requirements change, your design does not. This is such a fundamental observation, I'm going to say the whole thing again. You need to come up with a smaller set of building blocks that you can put together to satisfy each of the core use cases. Since all the other use cases are variation of the core use cases, what they represent is a different interaction between your building blocks, not a different decomposition thereof. So now when the requirements change, your design does not. And this simple observation has eluded almost everybody their entire career. Now, I call this concept composable design. Your mission as an architect is not how to do 1.2.3 versus 4.5.7. Nobody cares. Even if they care today, they will change tomorrow. Let's define the mission of the design. Let's define the design. By definition, the design must address all requirements. What does the word all actually mean? It means present and future, known and unknown. Nothing less will do. Because if there is a future requirement you can't handle, the design is not valid. And if there's something you mean today, don't worry about. If it's invalidating your architecture, design is not valid. The very definition of a good design is that it addresses all requirements, present and future, known and unknown. That's where the bar is set, nothing less will do. Anything else is a lie you tell yourself. It's a delusion. Okay. But how could I know what I don't know? And how could I know the future? The, sim the simple truth is that the only way to satisfy all requirements is not to design against any requirement in particular. That is the only way to address all requirements. And by having the smaller set of building blocks that you can put together to satisfy all of the core use cases, in spot and satisfy all the core, that's the key. Because the nature of the business hardly ever changes, you now can satisfy all requirements, present and future, known and unknown. That's it. Now, there's much more to it. I said, you have to come up with the smaller set of building blocks. I didn't say you have to come up with a set of building blocks. I put the word smallest in there. Why? There's two reasons. The first reason, you're not in the business of doing more work than what you have to get uh, by. What, you know, less is more when it comes to architecture. You understand? You're not in the business of doing more. You're in the business of doing less. So if I can get by with fewer components, it must be a better design. We agree? Now, if I give you a book with 300 use cases, the smallest possible set of components is one God component that does everything. For some reason, I can't put my finger on it, this doesn't really work. Now, for 20 years people tried to do this, this one God service, the God monolith that does it all. How is that working for you? It's just an ugly dumping ground of all the requirements, right? The internal complexity of a God service is such that no human can make sense of it. Technical debt, failure, and so on. But I could also come up with a design that has a component per use case. So if I give you 300 use cases, I have 300 components. Would that be a good design, yes or no? I think it would be a horrible design. Why? Think about the interaction 
and the communication of it between and nobody can understand all the relationship and the uh, feedback loops across all of this. It's just too complex. So one is the smallest, but it's obviously too small. 300 is obviously too many. So somewhere between 1 and 300 is your number. We agree? Let's try and agree on the order of magnitude of how many components you're going to need. Is it more like 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, and so on? What is the order of magnitude of how many you're going to need? 10. Now, it could be 12, could be 20. I mean, we're talking orders of magnitude. We're not talking specific numbers here. Correct? 10. The question is, why is 10? The reason is, if it's all about the possible combinations of putting those components together, by the time I have 10 components, how many, well, roughly 10, could be 12, how many ways I have of putting them together, roughly? 10 factorial. Wrong. I didn't say you shouldn't have repetitions or partial sets. Okay, if you allow repetition and partial sets, it's hyper-exponential. It's n to the n to the nth. That's what we're talking about. It's an astronomical number, even with 10 components. By the time we have 20 components, it's enough to count how many atoms are on the planet or something. Okay? By the time we have 20, 35 components, it's enough to count all the quarks in the universe. Okay? These are unbelievably runaway reactions. So even a small set of about 10 components gives you an unbelievable rich set of possible interactions. And that's why you don't need more than 10. You don't need 100. 10 is good enough. And this fundamental idea has nothing to do with software. The world around us is composed this way. For example, how many components are in this laptop right now? Memory, hard drive, CPU, graphic card, hard drive, roughly in order of magnitude, how many components? Order of magnitude would be? 10. Good. How many components are in your car? Engine block, gearbox, water pump, fuel pump. How many components? Roughly. In order of magnitude, how many? 10. How many components are here? Two kidneys, two liver, two kidneys, one liver, two lungs, spleen. How many components? Roughly. Order of magnitude, how many? 10. You think it's an accident? You think it's an accident? From automobile to to laptops, to biological entities, how could it be? It's because the same set of forces made it so. And the forces are evolution and economics. The laptop manufacturer has no incentive of putting extra components that are actually frivolous and unneeded. And they can't ship a half-baked laptop that doesn't have enough things that it takes. They were going to do just what it takes. Just enough, no more, the smallest set. But by the time you have about a dozen components, it's enough. Same by the way goes with cars. Same by the way goes here. Exactly the same thing goes here. Let me point out something, speaking about this design. The design of the human body was put forward on the plains of Africa 200,000 years ago. I'm pretty sure that being a software architect wasn't part of the spec at the time. <laughs> I could be wrong. And yet, I'm quite successful as a software architect. Now, in the mind of most developers, what I just said doesn't compute. It's like electrical shot. <laughs> Why? Because if you're going to allow one of your developers design one software legend, me, how are they going to do it? They're going to design against the requirements. They're going to be a box, write a book, speak at a conference. Design a system, conduct a masterclass, mow the lawn, drive to the airport. Well, all the things I need to do. You agree? Yes? Do I have a box here called conduct a seminar in Zurich? Let me check. <laughs> no. I don't. To make it even worse, how could it possibly be that I'm doing all of these things using exactly the same components as a pre-neolithic hunter-gatherer. That sentence totally doesn't compute. Well, it is true that I'm using the same components. But while I'm using the same components, I'm putting them together in different ways. Incidentally, 
the core use cases haven't changed. There's just one core use case, which is survive. We have never changed the core use cases for 200,000 years. The fluff, yes, hunter gatherer, farmer, architect, eh, whatever. Get it? Everything is put together this way. Always. So, now we know not too many core use cases, order of magnitude of about one, not too many components, order of magnitude of about ten. Let me ask you a question. Let's just try and agree on how long will it take to figure out that ten components. Assuming I already give you the core use cases. Let's agree on the order of magnitude. It's more like a second, a minute, an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, a century, a millennia, pick one. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? Day. I hear a day. Anybody else? A week? Yeah. A few days, we're going to call it a week. Nobody even said a month, okay? And what we're talking about here is within a day to a week, obviously if you have more experience, it's closer to a day than to a week, okay? We're talking about a ridiculously small amount of time that produces completely indestructible design. It is not good forever, against all requirements, present and future, known and unknown. Now, I know you don't necessarily know how to do it yet, but you sense it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal, if you know what you're doing. Do most people know what they're doing? <laughs> no way. Tell you a story here. In the late 90s, Mitchell was the chief software architect of a Fortune 100 company in Silicon Valley. Once or twice a year, I had to do a presentation to the board of the company. So I put on a tie and go across the parking lot and do a presentation. And in one of those, one of the board members was pushing me around. And it sounded like this. So this uh, so-called architecture of yours, how long it's going to be good for? And he probably expected, like any other quack, I would say, a year, two years, three years. And I told him, sir, the answer I really want to give you is forever. But forever is a really long time, and maybe over the prevailing centuries, the company will move into ballistic missile control. I mean, it could happen. I'm willing to put my name on 20 years, one human generation. Oh, 20 years, so audacious, arrogant. Two years ago, I conducted the Architects Masterclass in California, where I live. And in the audience is a director of engineering from the old company. And after this session, he comes to me and he says, we're still using your architecture. Every once in a while somebody lifts up the leads, maybe change some technology and such. Architecture, good, keep going. And it's been 20 years since that presentation to the board. Was I surprised? Absolutely not. Gratified, of course. <laughs> so now I'm into the third decade. And this is not the only example I have. I have not too many, but I have several systems I have put into productions that are now into the second or third decade. Okay? I've been doing this for more than 30 years, so you know I accumulate these things. I first noticed that we never design against the requirement in 1990. Now, it took me another 8 or 10 years to notice the universality of this concept, okay? And understand the fundamental design concept and everything else. One of the problems I noticed, by the way, as an aside in my master classes, is that it doesn't matter if I'm teaching people how to design systems or how to design projects, I'm fundamentally trying to teach them how to design, and they were never taught how to design, let alone design software systems. So I was struggling with these things. What I did in writing software, I simply outlined a whole set of design first principles. And then in the book, I'm showing how you do it in software. Well, it's almost incidental. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question. You have identified a small set of building blocks. About 10, could be 12. Could be 20 even, but a small set. A small set of building blocks that you can put together to satisfy any requirements. In fact, you can put them together fairly quickly because you don't really change the components. You just change the interaction between them. And that means as requirements change over here, you respond to it quickly over here. Now let me ask you another question. Isn't the ability to respond quickly 
to changes in the business, the essence of agility? Yes. Now you know how to be agile. The word, not the voodoo. All you know is how to do agile. You know how to go through the motions, through the rituals. You know how to buy the indulgences. But everything that you do by designing against the requirements guarantees the lack of agility. So when the requirements change, you have maximized pain. Isn't that kind of strange? That on one hand, you claim to be agile. On the other hand, everything you do denies agility. This is the only way to deliver on the agility your business craves and you have been denying so far. At the same time, all these so-called pure agilists will resent any attempt of doing design, not so agile, big up on design, and all these excuses, which is all it is, just excuses. Okay, now let me ask you another question. Suppose you're doing it this way. I don't think there's any way of doing it, so you're doing it this way. Let's talk about value. Now, every one of these things is essential, but let's talk about the relative value. What is valuable? Is it valuable to wine and dine customers, get their trust, get them to cough money at you? Yes. Is it valuable to find the smallest set of things you can possibly get away with over here and moon versus Swiss cheese and all the things you're going to do? Is it a lot of added value to capture the actual required behavior of the system? Absolutely. Is a lot of added value in coming up with a small set of bidding blocks that you can put together to satisfy all use cases, present and future, known and unknown? Absolutely. Is a lot of value in documenting your system in a way that's going to be good for posterity across decades, its operational concept, the interaction, and so on? Yes. Is a lot of value in actually validating your design, proving almost mathematically that this design is going to be good forever? Yes. How about this? Coding. Is this high or low added value activity? I know. So is it high or low added value activity? Low. Now the reason I could only coax two of you to say it, and the reason you're struggling with it, is because you're used to only doing this. Now if this is all that you do, then all the value is here. I just propose you stop doing it that way. If you do it this way, then this is low added value. Now, I didn't say it's not essential. I just said it's low added value. Don't confuse the things. For example, look at your iPhone. What is, if this is the flow of the iPhone, well, what is the most valuable piece of this entire thing in an iPhone? This. Getting somebody to pay $1,000 for something that is as good as a $40 Android is a marketing fit. Yes? Okay. All of these, the components, the cell phone, of course. But you know, they sold the iPhone in China in basically sweatshops. People that get paid Chinese minimum wage and are treated horribly. Correct? Now, you still have to do it. It's just not where the value is. So you send it to China. Did Apple send to China this or this or this or this or they still do that in Cupertino? Which one is it? Okay? Now you used for only doing this, so all the value is here. I propose you stop doing it this way. That's why it's hard for you to come to terms with the fact that this is done this way, low added value. So we know it is low added value. The question is why it is low added value. You already used an interesting word. It says it's transformation and translation. Okay. Transformation and translation, these are basically mechanical activities. Because this is done this way, mechanical, it is low added value. And this is not mechanical, I'm sorry. This is not mechanical. Done this way, this is. Now, 
If this is mechanical, why not have a machine do it? I mean, mechanical, machine, almost the same word. Both come from the Greek word mechina. So it's almost the same word. Why not have a machine do it? What, what's that? I know, we're coming, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. So, why not have a machine do it? Now, if we have a machine do it, suppose, suppose. And by the way, this is classic for machines to do, right? Done this way. Then, what impact will it have on the industry? What impact will it have on you? Let's actually discuss what you're actually seeing here. What you see here is a software factory. This is an assembly line for software. Requirements, kachunk, 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 code falls off over here. It even looks like an assembly line. Now today, we do not have an industrialist approach to software development. Today, we do software development by hand. Look, before the Industrial Revolution, in the 1800s, people did build machines. People did doc build locomotives and, and, and steam engines, even in the 18th century. But you know, every machine was done by hand. Every machine was a one-off. Every machine required experts. Every machine had its own unique parts. Nothing was interchangeable, maintainable, extensible, reusable. Things used to blow up. They weren't secure. And it requires an army of ants to go and file by hand every, every, every bolt and every rivet. And then the Industrial Revolution started, and we started building machines this way. In software, we haven't had that transition yet. We do software as if it's before the Industrial Age. I believe that eventually the tools here will catch up. On two reasons. First, they always do, eventually. Second, the economics here is undeniable. We've reached the end of the road of using humans as programmers. We simply cannot keep up. We have exceeded the complexity. In the complexity of the software, we exceed the ability of the human brain to make sense of it. All of you suffer inability of hiring developers. Why? Because we know that one bad developer makes work for another seven bad developers. Right? This creates is another reaction. We can't do it anymore. So I believe that once the tools will catch up, we're going to experience the equivalent of the software industrial revolution. Now, in such a world, are we going to need same, more or fewer developers? More, fewer, fewer. Fewer! A little fewer or a lot fewer? A lot. I agree. So I think this is our future. <laughs> I could be wrong on that. I could be wrong. But that's the way things are. Look, before the Industrial Revolution, what percentage had to work the fields? Do you know what percentage? Was it 100%? 100% had to walk behind the ox seven days a week? So what percentage had to work the fields? It was about 97%. Yeah, almost everyone. Almost everyone, 97%. After the Industrial Revolution, the combine, the tractor, fertilizer, all of that, what percentage today work the fields? It exactly flipped the ratio. Now it's 3% working the fields. Nowhere did the Industrial Revolution make farmer completely obsolete. Why? Because without farmers, we're all going to die. We just don't going to need, we don't need as many farmers as we did 150 years ago. Now, when this thing would actually happen, which it's my opinion, and let me put an opinion stamp, it's my opinion that it's going to happen. I could be wrong. Is that transition going to happen gradually or in a blink of an eye? A blink of an eye. Why? First of all, there's two reasons. One, historical. Historically, professions never died gradually. What happened to the milkman with the invention of the refrigerator? Poof, gone. What happened to the blacksmith? 
You do you know that every street corner here in Zurich, a hundred years ago, used to have a blacksmith? Every street corner. In fact, it was likely there were the smithy there since the time of the Roman. Father to son, father to son, father to son, right? For 50 generations. Could be. Absolutely. Why? Horses. I'm going to bet if I were to go outside here in 1910, I would find a smithy within a minute. I would have to ride a horse to it, but... Right? How long did it take for all of them to be replaced with gas stations? Okay. A second, a minute, an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, a century. Now, I don't know the numbers for Zurich, but I know numbers for New York. And you can't really look at complete transition because even today there's horses in New York. There's some tourist horses, the police is using horses. So there's some horses in New York even today. So the car didn't completely replace the horse. But the numbers are that from 90% horses, 10% cars, to 90% cars, 10% horses, took 13 years. And this was 110 years ago, where the rate of change was slightly less. And think about what they had to do. They had to replace every stall and every blacksmith with a garage mechanic and a gas station and distribution of gasoline and tires and pave the roads and move the poop and everything had to happen. And it took 13 years. What is happening today, by the way, for taxi drivers? Not because of Uber, but because of Uber. Well, Uber's, Uber didn't replace the taxi driver as a profession, it just changed who is a taxi driver. But that's not the big transition that's going to happen. Because Uber is going to replace all the taxi drivers with self-driving cars. And once that happens, how long will it take? Immediately. What's going to happen to all the truck drivers? Think about how many... There's probably millions of truck drivers in Europe. Easily. Millions. Right? The moment the first trucking company start using driverless trucks, and by the way, there's a kit based for a few thousand dollars, turns a regular truck to a driverless truck. Nobody could stay in business if your competitor are using it. And that's basically the economics here. Once this thing actually happened, the transition would be a blink of an eye because nobody could afford to stay in business against the machines. So we all agree that if the transition happens, which is in if, we don't know, it's going to be a blink of an eye. Right? Since we know that tools in software eventually catch up, let us try and use our gut to estimate how long it will take. How far are we from this transition? Is it more like a second, a minute, an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, a century, a millennia, pick one? Decade. Who says decade? Who says a century? Okay. So nobody said a century, which means it's within the career horizon of everybody in this room. Anybody says a year? Okay. Well, it turns out that whoever said a decade is wrong. Because this has already happened. So the correct answer should have been order of magnitude of zero. And the reason is, today we have AI. And so, could we have AI build these workflows? Now, you still have to give it a correct set of building blocks, which is a smaller set which is composable into any conceivable requirements. The whole thing is predicated on having a composable design. I call this idea artificial agility. And why? This is the agility that your business is craving and that most developers have been denying. Developers have given every company out there an incentive to get rid of them. They all make excuses and they claim to be agile when in fact they're slow, expensive, full with defects and can't respond too quickly to market requirements, changes. You know. Not very hard on the list of anybody to keep a bunch of people that make a lot of excuses, especially when they're expensive. 
And so we're going to get the agility one way or the other. The other, in this case, means without you. Now, this won't happen in the void. The architecture is absolutely the enabler of this. The architecture is what gives us the composability. Now, what we're going to have, we're going to have the AI sitter, learn the requirement, and start devising solutions. Now, even with 10 components, you're going to have bazillion, bazillion, bazillion uh, uh, possibilities. But you don't have to do it brute force. Why? Because in any good architecture, we can establish interaction rules. Client can call business logic. Business logic can't call clients, for example. And we can establish some ground rules on different uh, call patterns. And that will drastically reduce the number of combinations. It's still going to be very large, but it's going to be a manageable set. Now, a human being is not going to sit there and try a combination to see which one makes the best. But for a machine, it's called Wednesday afternoon. Okay? Well, it doesn't care. In fact, you can do a lot of what if as a machine. Suppose it would change like this. We'd actually try and predict the changes of the requirements and come up with a forward-looking design. You understand? So we're not sort of playing catch-up. We try and be ahead of the market. Show me one business that wouldn't want to do that. Of course, I want to do that. Also, you can use some basic logic. I mean, it's kind of like what compilers already do today. Is if taken, not taken. Let's take both branches and see what happens. Why not? And then wait later on next iteration. Or we can run in parallel all the current input against 700 different flavors of the architecture, see what one works the best. And you can optimize this way for performance, for security, for response time, for maintenance time. And oh, no, no, no. Things that we can't even dream about today. Why? Because we're doing it by hand. I told you this is already happening. This article is from February 2017, two years ago. AI learned to write its own code by stealing from other programs. Okay, let me explain to you what's going on here. This is just clickbait. Nobody is stealing anything. What we have here is a project at Microsoft Research where they taught AI to solve problems by going to Stack Overflow and copy and pasting from there. So it's not stealing any code from anybody. It's Stack Overflow. Between you and me, since this is what most developers are doing anyway, it wasn't a big stretch. <laughs> okay? In fact, I have it on good authority from the person working on this project that their AI has already reached parity with human developers. Do you know why? Because their AI has already blamed the previous AI for the problem. <laughs> Now, whenever there's an article, the editor has a pull-out. It's a sentence that they choose to highlight. Okay? Here is in black the sentence the editor highlighted. It's not my sentence, it's the editor's sentence. It could allow non-coder, that would be business people, to simply describe an idea for the program and let the system build it. Bing! Perfect. Perfect. And this is two years ago. Where are they now in this project? Oh, and by the way, if you have an AI of a program, you know what would be my first task to it? Write me a better AI. And you know what I'm going to do with that one, don't you? I'm going to build a better, a better AI. Here's another article. This one is from February 19, so a year ago. The highlight here is, is really bad, so uh, it's just they don't know anything about contrast, but it says AI that codes. Now, this article doesn't have pullout, but I use a highlighter to read some sentences for you. How to build different kinds of components and how to weave them together. Hmm, sounds like composable design. It's assemble, assembling building blocks of ready-made code. And you know, my book was even published. A core set of building blocks that make it super fast to build a wide array of software. Ha! Huh. Look at that. Look at that. And they tested it against human developers, and they say it built the software a thousand times faster. Now, what does this mean? It could be infinite times faster, but 
You always need one or two developers there, maybe some final touches, some oil between the gears and such, right? Net server is exaggerated. It's not a thousand times, it's only a hundred times. Does it matter? Let's say even that is an exaggeration, it's a thousand, it's, a, it's ten times faster. Does it matter? Does it matter if it's only ten times faster? And the answer is no. No developer will stay employed if there's a machine that costs ten faster than humans. It's not going to happen. Now, again, we're not going to eliminate all developers here. 97% sounds about right. Look, in most projects today, because they don't do proper project design, there's crazy horrendous overcapacity anyway. So, we can do a lot more with a lot less, if you know what I mean. And this is in the past. This has already happened. So I believe this is our future. I could be wrong on that. I could be wrong. It's just an opinion. But what does it mean for you? You don't care about the industry. You don't care about your company. The only one you care about is you. What does it mean for you? Okay, let me point out something. If the Terminator is coming for you and you're called Sarah Connor, it's not a good day. Yes? Do you understand what I'm saying? This thing is coming for your developers. You don't want to be a developer. Now, I love programming, okay? But you know what? I also love farming. I'm a hobbyist farmer. I have a farm. I have chickens and bees and bunnies and fruits. But I also calculated my farm and egg cost $12. Yeah. Yeah. An egg cost $12 in my farm. Why? Well, I have to take into account my time, the cost of the capital, and this and that. That's what it costs. I don't have, you know, in a commercial egg producing farm, you could have a quarter million chickens. Then you get 10 cents an egg. I don't have that economy of scale. I can never compete. Now, as a home, it's fantastic. Give me in good shape. With lots of fresh air, it's all good. It's a nice hobby, but you can't sustain yourself. You see what I'm saying? And that's kind of like where programming is heading. It would be a nice hobby. It would be a nice hobby. You need to take a long and hard look at the rest of your career. Now, if you are five years away from retirement, maybe you don't care. But short of that, you could have maybe several decades ahead of you. You don't want to be discarded. You don't want to be the milkman or the blacksmith. Or the truck driver. You need to align, align yourself to ride the wave, not be drowned by it. You understand? If you focus on doing this, the Terminator is coming for you. I suggest you focus on doing this. Learn how to do this very well. The people that would know how to do this well are going to be worth their weight in gold. And think about it. Companies are going to have all this excess money you to spend on developers. Now they're going to spend, okay, who can give this to us? You? Name your price. That's how it's going to play out. It's going to be a bonanza for architects that we have never seen in the industry. From quacks to kings, those who know how to do it right. Okay? So I already told you, take a long, hard look at what you want to do with yourself for the rest of your career and choose wisely. Don't choose poorly. Now, I did say that in order for this to work, we're going to have to feed into the T2000 here, we're going to feed it the requirements. Which means this would have to understand the requirements. Right now, AI is not very good at it. AI is very good at pattern matching. But if we, read, if we make it read a page of text, maybe it can do image processing on the words. It doesn't know what, what it means. And there's all these stories about you know, Google spending millions and hundreds of millions of dollars on teaching AI to know a cat, not a cat. They took all the Google, image, all the Google images, pictures of cats, and somebody sat there and said, a cat, not a cat, a cat, not a cat. Okay? 
but the fact that the AI knows a cat not a cat doesn't mean it can do a dog not a dog. That's a totally different AI, right? And even if the software knows to identify a cat in an image, does it know that the cat purrs and that it likes to drink milk? Is there any context there for that understanding? And the answer is no. It doesn't know it. And so the next missing link is not just pattern recognition, but true understanding. So how long before we're going to have AI that has true understanding? A second, a minute, an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, a century, it's a decline. Take a while. This will take a while. Yeah. This will take a while. Who says, okay, give me an order of magnitude. You think a century? A century? I'm giving you 30 years, okay? But don't quote me. Don't so we'll say a decade. Anybody else? What's up? Century. A century. And you're all wrong, because the correct order of magnitude is? Zero. Zero, because it already happened. You're just not keeping up. <laughs> There's a reading test called the Stanford Reading Test. The Stanford Reading Test is a corpus of a hundred thousand reading comprehension question. It's all in the form of his paragraph of text and question on it. And you have to select the right answer. Okay? And humans don't score perfectly on the Stanford test, by the way. Humans score 84%. For the first time in January 18, a Microsoft AI beat a human on the Stanford reading test. Now, this is also clickbait, because that didn't happen. For the very first time, and Microsoft AI achieved parity with the human being and achieved 84%. That's the only thing that happened. But it's, it's more clickable if it beat the human. Okay? I said, really, I went to the Stanford Reading Test website, I downloaded all the results that were better than 50% and I plotted them. Now, why did I look at better than 50%? You know, if your AI scores worse than 50%, you're better off tossing a coin than using AI. So, obviously, we have to look at better than 50%. So, look at all these squiggles up and down, but they also end a linear trend line through it, and you can see there's a positive trend here. This is getting better and better. Incidentally, this is the 84%. I did this when the story came out. And I also did projection. I projected this trend to see when it would reach perfect results. And the answer was June 2020. According to this, three months from now, we're going to have machines with perfect understanding. Now, it's been three years since I did that. Why am I not showing you? <laughs> Why am I not showing you the latest numbers? We're almost there. I mean, a few months. Because it's wrong. Because it's wrong, exactly. Because that's not... Well, it's not the same. What the vendors actually did here, they developed AI that are very good at scoring high numbers on the Stanford reading test. Yeah. That's what they did. The, what's that? Exactly. And so, they didn't really have understanding. They're just very, very good at answering the Stanford reading test. Okay? And if you, did, if you give it a paragraph or any subject and you ask questions about it, the machine doesn't answer the questions the way you answer the questions. When you read a paragraph, you don't answer the question on the paragraph based on the information on the paragraph alone. You bring into it decades of knowledge and all the books you've read before and all the movies you've seen, and all the social cues that you have, and then you read the information in the paragraph and make decisions based on that. The AI doesn't do any of that. It runs some sophisticated statistical guesses as to which one it's going to be. That's not understanding. You don't statistically say, well, we've used too many A's so far, let's choose a B. You don't answer it this way. And so Stanford cancelled this test. <laughs> and they revised the test, and they have added to the test the problems of context and generalization. What's that? You all came here to this session and you sat on a chair. You have never seen this chair before in your life. 
How did you know it was a chair? How did you know it can even carry your weight? Okay. In your brain, you didn't have a picture of this chair. In your brain, you had a generalized concept of a chair. And you fitted this specific chair to that general concept. Okay. That's one point. The general concept is actually encoded very efficiently. It's and it's coded very efficiently. Sorry. Sorry about yes, that. yes, and we can discuss <laughs> the use of energy, and we discuss yeah. a number of new ones. Cool yeah. There's tons of things, there's tons of other things going on here. And then you generalize this is actually a chair. And then you made some other assumptions. You said, why would you invite me to a meetup in Zurich and give me crooked chairs where I'm going to fall on? I mean, it's greater than zero probability, but it's probably not going to happen. I'm going to sit on it. Which is a whole different level of understanding what you actually are using right now. There's assumption here about social contrast, uh, contract and trust. And all these things made you sit on this chair. I mean, maybe we're practicing some Dervish scheme and we're going to put nails on the chair. I mean, it could happen. We didn't do it. Right? You understand? AI doesn't do this. So now they're coming up with a different test that forces them to actually have that kind of knowledge. And they've started running the test again. And I looked at the numbers and there's a positive trend there too. Now that's still in the 50-55% range, so that, that's still not, not nearly as impressive as this. You know, you think it's like a century? Are you kidding me? So maybe next year when I'm doing this seminar, I will have the, 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 the new chart that has more interesting points, and I'll do a trend line on that one, and we'll see, what is it? I don't think it's going to be 2030, by the way. Not even close. My point here is, this is coming, it's coming hard and fast. Take a long hard look at the rest of your career. Start training your mind to look for these things. Knowing how to do good composable design is like a muscle. You have to hone it, you have to train it. Okay? The examples are everywhere. If I were to do a competent toolbox the way you are doing uh, code, I would have to have a tool specific for every building ever built. No? But in fact, how many tools are in a toolbox in order for me to do for carpenter? How many tools? A measurement tape, a ruler, a, a saw, a hammer, a level, about 10. You can build any house now. Look at your immune system. There's near infinite possible number of pathogens that could infect you. For you to survive, if you were to do design against the requirements, you would have to have infinite set of antigen in your body, uh, just good to go. Is this how you actually fight diseases? No. You have a very small set of about 10 proteins and ribosomes and such. Your immune system detects what's going on, says, okay, let me do it. Here, go for that one. That's it. Everything is done this way. Okay. You need to learn how to do this quickly, efficiently, and then basically you name your price. There's more on these ideas on the Addison website. You can download the slides on this link. My book, Writing Software, contains these ideas. In fact, tonight's session was chapter four. What happened in chapter two and three and such? Well. I didn't talk about how you do it, I talked about what you need to do. The previous two chapters talk about how do you identify those building blocks, I give you structure and taxonomy and relationship and everything else, you can actually do it in a day to a week, it doesn't take too much time to do it. You can find more information about my master classes over here, and you will need to succeed to do both the system design portion and the project design portion. And right, there you go. Yeah. What happened to the AI you showed us about one and a half years ago? AI I showed you years ago? About one and a half years ago you showed us a slide about the AI system that you were designing, consulting. What happened to that? Um, I'm no longer in contact with that person. As far as I know, not much. So, don't know.
Yeah. With an AI with its uh, deep understanding prevent to also be capable of doing the composition of the work? Great question. If we have such a great AI, could it actually do the composition of the blocks and everything else? And it turns out that as far as we understand AI, the answer is no. If we have generic AI, the answer is probably yes. But I think by then we're going to have some significant other problems, because generic AI can do a bunch of other things. But this kind of AI is not generic AI. It's going to be limited for developing software system against composable design. It wouldn't be able to play chess. Okay? It's, not, it's not going to be generic AI. And it turns out coming up with generic AI requires creativity at level that we can't imagine AI doing today. But there's another reason why they're not going to do AI to replace architects. And it has to do with the market cap of it. If you're writing AI that replaces developers, that's a really good market because there's lots of developers, millions of them are very expensive. How many architects you have out there? It, it's not that economical to develop super sophisticated AI for really, really tough problems that you can only send here and there. It, it doesn't make much economic sense. So even if it is possible, uh, there's some economic barriers for this step. It's going to be cheaper to hire a human architect to do it. At least for now. At least in the foreseeable future. Usually the, the, the problem is not actually getting the right books, right? It's, you can do it, other people can do it. The problem is the sales, right? So basically the, the usual problem is your product encounter is that, okay, how do you convince people that this approach will lead to better results, given that, of course, track record is a problem, projects are not exactly comparable. You know, they can always say, oh, if, if Joe would have done it with Scrum, it would be the same. That's what I'm okay. trying to So right? the question is, how do you, <laughs> how does, how does how do you start doing do these kind of things? How do you sell it? Yeah. And there's two answers here, okay? Mm -hmm. The first answer is called Darwinism. Yep. Those who will do it will survive, and those who won't, won't. So I don't have to worry too much, okay? This is going to happen. In fact, I did this session three weeks ago in South Africa, and I had 400 people in front of me, not 40. And one of the people in the, and, and there was a company that hosted me there. And more people in the audience said, but how can you convince the company to do this? And do you know any companies doing this? And I was about to say the answer about Darwinism. Suddenly, the CEO of the company I was with stands up, picks up the mic and says, we are going to work here this way. You're welcome to try and apply for a job here. <laughs> okay, so he gets it. So that's one answer. But there's another answer here, which is, you don't have to ask for permission. You never ask for permission for doing the right thing. This is the right thing to do. Everything else is abuse. It's abuse of time, of customers, of trust, of career potentials. It's abuse. It's waste. This is clearly the right thing to do. In life, you never ask permission for doing the right thing. Because if you disagree with that, at the end of that crooked line of thinking lies the statement, I was just following orders which we know is not a very valid defense, is it? Okay? So you have to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because the boss agreed, not because anything. Now, you have to understand, nobody's going to complain when you do this. What are they going to say? What have you done? You met the schedule? You responded quickly to market requirements? They're not going to complain. Okay? Hold on a second. And so, you do this. In addition, it's a lot easier to do this than to argue about doing this. And so just do it. Don't try and pontificate. Don't try and change the world. The only thing you need to do here is save yourself. Understand? That's it. If the other company, it doesn't matter. You need to do this. And by the way, this is so easy to do. It's certainly easier than the alternative, which is just a giant ball of mud, which is what you always do. Okay? There is no downside for doing this. No need to argue. You just do it. <laughs>